Okay, but Jerry, just a bit of a challenge there. We heard this morning from a patient and others that doctors aren't quite ready, and Vina added as well, Shankaran, that doctors aren't terribly well equipped at all to provide information about the cost side. We know that most of those friendly docs about whom you're referring don't have the sort of health services research acumen of a Kai Young or a Jalpa Doshi. Uh, that, so how do we make sure that the doctors in whom you've got such great confidence have the tools, have the information at the ready to make that trustworthy and evidence-based decision? Well, I think, you know, to the, they are going to, to medical school. They are getting continuing medical education. They really haven't had, that, had to make those decisions in the past. They haven't. But I think when you give them that responsibility, they will step up to the plate and be able to do it. But that's, uh, you know, that's, that's a guess. But I, I, I have more confidence because I think my health situation is different than your health situation. <coughs> And what Mark and all our data can do is say, for the average person, this is what's doing it. I can start making adjustments for men and women and all sorts of other things. But I don't have that, that same confidence that, as a statistician, I can do all those adjustments. Got it. OK, in this order, Matt, Grant, Mark, all of whom want to so, say. So I think the world that Jerry's talking about is really like a Medicare fee-for-service world. Right. I know many of our members are engaged with uh, risk sharing arrangements and ACO type arrangements with um, health systems and providers that include that do include drugs. And so when they're sharing data and information between health plans and, and physicians and back and forth that there it really is for the total cost of care, not for every type of condition, um, not for every type of procedure, but increasingly, it is accounting for those types of drug interventions and how do they fit into the total cost of care. I'd say Medicare is a program, while it's made significant strides in terms of moving towards value, is still behind the times, right. largely. Behind the private sector. Yeah. yeah. Point well taken. Thank you very much, Matt. Grant on this. Yeah. Um, the term value is probably one of the most widely distributed term I've ever heard. So if you Maybe. think about it simply for today, is value the most financially prudent drug with a reasonably good outcome? Or is it the very best possible <coughs> drug for your individual outcome? And maybe it is at a premium price. And I think the argument always falls in that, which choice are we making? Are we really trying to find out what is the very best possible drug for that patient? Um, or are we looking for one that's going to be a reasonably good enough drug at a very good discount price? And I think there was this craze in managed care over a number of years towards cost minimization. How can I get the very possible cheapest drug? And sometimes that was good enough. As a matter of fact, many times that was Often. good enough. But it wasn't always good enough. And I still see that we're driving towards how can I get the lowest possible price rather than I think what is the long-term value, which is the best possible outcome, particularly mm. in something like a cancer or an MS or a rheumatoid arthritis, something like that where you're gonna have lifetime consequences. You know, employers are always trying to keep the premiums down as low as they can, and that's great because I think they're trying to protect the affordability of the premium so they can offer reasonably cost health insurance to their employees. But what you find when you look at the data is that the sicker the employee is, the longer they stay. So that if you don't give them good care upfront, if you don't offer them the very best drug for the most uh, effective and efficient outcome, they're gonna get sicker and sicker and actually over the course of their tenure cost you more money than anybody else. So there's a lot of kind of um, uh, conflicting surfaces, if you wanna call them that, between that employee who doesn't leave, who's gonna get sicker and sicker, and trying to save a buck today because your premium is braced on yeah. this year's spending. Point very well taken, thanks for that, Grant. Mark? I'm gonna just briefly clarify, Jerry, what we're doing is exactly the opposite of the average approach. So we're, so there are drugs like many people have, might have heard the term beta blockers. Beta blockers are cost saving in people with heart failure. They're cost effective in the setting of hypertension and angina. They may be wasteful in people who take them for performance anxiety. But the idea that, you know, as, as Kai Young was talking about, the next stage of the value-based formulary is not just saying a class of drugs should have a separate cost share. We use the $5 billion of EMR investment that we've only used thus far for cost share, for a charge capture, as opposed to helping our patients to really move 
this idea of precision medicine forward. But I think the key point talking about under no circumstances would anything that VBED all, or alternative payment models want to get in front of the clinician and the patient, we would like to think, as someone said, that evidence is used to the highest level of value. But you know this is coming, Cliff, uh, the peanut butter and jelly story here, that the key levers in healthcare transformation to value in this country is not the demand side, the patients. The key levers are the providers. And we have made great progress with bipartisan support to move from fee-for-service to something else. I'm not going to say bundles are better than global caps or ACOs or MOUSEs, but I'm saying moving away from the abomination of fee-for-service is a good idea. And I would basically say why clinicians now care about what we're doing on the benefit side is because now my colleagues in primary care are getting part of their bonus based on how many of their diabetic patients, not everyone, of their diabetic patients go to the eye doctor every year. It turns out the fastest growing type of health plan in this country, an HSA, HDHP, doesn't cover at all a diabetic eye exam. So the clinicians are now seeing their bonuses tied to a crappy benefit design and now saying, I want to align clinicians, peanut butter, patients, jelly, right, and have them in this classic example of the sum being greater than the individual parts. So the providers have moved in that direction. Currently, the love of HSA high deductible health plans are actually putting an obstacle in place of a 20-year bipartisan movement to create more value in the healthcare. So to clarify, though, and this will come back eventually to patient assistance, the high deductible health plan is a barrier to what can be highly cost-effective care for many patients, including a lot of patients with chronic diseases. You would keep the deductible in place, but not for certain things that are clearly beneficial. You'd set it aside, and there would be no deductible for those services. Here's my line for Matt. I love high deductibles. Here's my line for Jenny. I want deductibles only to apply to services that don't make Americans any healthier, right? So I'd like to blame pharma or AHIP or other stakeholders. The constituent in the, in the current bad policy are those dreaded health policy lawyers at the Internal Revenue Service, who in 2004 created something called a pre-deductible safe harbor. Those services that, that might be covered, some first dollar, but some with cost sharing, before the deductibles met, 6,000, 12,000 on the way up. It turns out that those wise health policy IRS agents put in a bunch of primary care services, screenings, counselings, immunizations, but they explicitly excluded any service to treat an existing injury, illness, or condition, which is 100% of the requests that Dan and Amy get. Right. So that's we, the disconnect. We have proposed for 10 years, now have multi-stakeholder and bipartisan political support to allow plans to voluntarily expand the pre-deductible safe harbor. And this is something that Marilyn Tavener supported in her blog post Monday. Uh, we know uh, okay. Jenny's organization has supported uh, for a very long time. Because it's voluntary nature, right, it gives these plans a chance to spend dollars better in the in the in the health plans spending, the health savings account spending, and hopefully reduce the amount of applications that Dan and Amy get. And Matt was just nodding his head. Are you with that, Jenny? I am with that. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I'm leaving on a high I, note. And I think, I think Mark knows that. I was going to actually pivot, though, and say that, you know, in the Medicare context, as we think about Medicare Part D and about um, the challenges here, since that's so much a part of, of Pam's world, uh, the sort of analogy to the problems of high deductible health plans is the specialty tier, which again um, is sort of placing high cost sharing on medicines in an arbitrary way without the ability to have a patient uh, seek an exception, even when it's been prior authorized by the plan, they've gone through step therapy, it's absolutely the right medicine because they have a genetic marker for the medicine. So yeah. I, I think that's an example of where Part D could be modernized to be more value-based. Well, point well taken. Uh, in a few minutes, we're going to go to your questions. Uh, don't be shy. These people can handle it. So if you've got a tough question, <laughs> let them have it. Uh, and you stand between them and the door anyway. So you'll get an answer. Dan, on this. So, you know, in the context of uh, this uh, 
solution that is emerging from uh, Mark and uh, our colleagues uh, from uh, the payer community and the pharma community. Um, the, the issue for PAN and other safety net providers is we're just suspicious that they're going to still be a group of people falling through the cracks who are going to need assistance regardless of how intelligent the benefit design is, value-based or whatever comes beyond value-based. And the reason I say that, again, goes back to sort of thinking about Medicare Part D with the low-income subsidy and the non-LIS and the differential in utilization. So we know that um, uh, income or means-tested kinds of programs are pretty hard to um, get through public policy vetting and they're not really part of typical insurance design. And in many ways, what the patient assistance programs, uh, at least the charitable programs like PN provide is a sort of means-tested high-risk pool. We do means test. We do look for uh, people to be at or below a certain level of federal poverty level. And then we do provide assistance. Now, we'd much rather narrow that assistance that we provide to just um, value-based treatment, cost-effective treatment. That would shrink the, the demand, if you will, the need, but it, it will still be there. And I think that the question, or one of the questions being asked today is, longer term, what is the role of patient assistance and how do you sustain that? Um, and when I talk about it being uncertain right now, it's uncertain in the environment where it's been growing and growing and growing and growing and expected to grow. And I think we're hearing that some people are getting nervous about that. Some people are getting nervous, but we've heard a couple of reasons why we can be optimistic, one of which is if the system becomes more value-oriented, whatever dollars are available, as I understand, for patient assistance will go, will be better spent. Jenny's companies are not showing any signs of backing off this, and as Jerry would point out, it might even be helpful for their bottom line to continue to, act and do, to, to do so. Any questions at this point uh, for the group? Yes, uh, name and affiliation, please. So, Kai, Kai Young, uh, Group Health. So uh, my question is for Jenny and for Matt. Um, with regards to this growing disparity between list prices and price net of rebates, um, and how that impacts uh, negatively patients on high-price specialty medications, um, my question is why is do you think that is happening and could potentially um, increases in pricing transparency with regards to this net price um, be part of that solution? I'll start. So, I mean, uh, we, we know that, um, you know, over time that there has been you know, a growth in, in rebates and some of that's due to the way that plans and PBMs negotiate. Um, it depends on the level of competition within a particular therapeutic class. I, what I would be um, mindful of, so we are supportive of certain types of transparency, but I think if you are going to have to publish um, you know, what rebates are at a particular drug level, I, I think that that's actually counterproductive. I think there's been good analysis that's been done by the Congressional Budget Office and others that, that indicate that that's actually going to increase costs. I mean, of course, we'd like to see prices start at a lower level rather than a higher level. I don't know that there would be as great a need for, for rebates and discounts in the system, but um, we do also know that there are efforts by plans and PBMs to look at, at this particular trend and are there ways to uh, create different benefit designs and, and ways that at least a portion of that flows through. So much of it is complicated as a result of the way that the rebate uh, system is set up, uh, mostly retroactive, uh, I'm sorry, retro retrospective, that you have to, you know, have meet certain performance targets before you figure out what your rebate is. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of different complexities there. I think, I don't know that transparency of the net price actually helps matters at the end, um, and we'd be very suspicious of, of that. Okay, thank you. Jenny, on this issue? So, I, I think that uh, I would sort of agree with, with Matt that, it, it, that transparency about that net price is less what's needed than um, uh, ways of making sure that patients are really benefiting. And that is a really complicated um, process, and I think there are a lot of folks in the 
market, we were beginning to try to think about that in creative ways. So I see manufacturers and PBMs and health plans all sort of working on that problem. Um, uh, so I think that I think that's where I would be. Uh, like it, there's been plenty of evidence that if you actually publish the exact net price of a transaction between a specific payer and a specific manufacturer, that um, that level of transparency drives up prices. It doesn't drive prices down. So we we don't need to we don't want to make uh, we don't want to create problems that way. Um, and I think uh, that that's been the consensus of. CBO and other economists. At the same time, we clearly do need to um, find some ways to make sure that that the rebates are, are really flowing through the whole system. So, I'd say this is an area of like ongoing thinking and policy development. And just for a good doctoral dissertation, yes, Jerry. So, so essentially, I think you know you can't say exactly how much Pfizer sold it to to Anthem or whatever for a particular drug or particular. Express script. I mean, I think we could all agree, or most all of us agree on that. What you can do is, is be much more transparent on the average net price that's out there, um, because that's what the consumer is paying, and that's essentially what they need to know in deciding drug A or drug B. Not the list price, is what they've got, but the, the price that is close to what's being paid. That's the information that I think we all want. Get in the ballpark, yes. Any further on this particular only issue? While you're, only while you're in the deductible. Remember, uh -huh. Americans do not care about drug prices. They care what it costs them. And if we didn't have this rose, rise of high deductible health plan, I, I totally agree with Jerry, because now the price of the drug is the price the patient's paying. Yeah. When we start changing the deductible and the cost sharing thing, then they'll just be totally happy to pay their 50 bucks for their right. EpiPen. How hard would it be to get enough information from individual patients to be able to make real-time decisions about what this next drug decision is going to cost them, so, this next prescription. So Can't we do that yet? Really quickly, I, I don't think most people view Medicare or TRICARE as particularly nimble organizations. You heard Fair this enough. morning from Kai, so the, the VBIT MA demo is now in 10 diseases in 10 states. Grant will agree with me. Matt will agree with me. Most plans know who their diabetics are, their heart failure patients are, their depression patients. They've been collecting this information for decades. So I realize that they may not be as nuanced as Jerry wants, but it's better than the average population. So Medicare, 10 diseases, 10 states, bipartisan support to expand that condition-based concept to all 50 states. The TRICARE program viewed as the most least nimble, President Obama X, whatever, December 27th signed a, the NDA authorizing a v, large VBIT demonstration in the TRICARE program, again, condition-based. So I, I'm not the person who does these things, but the fact that those organizations, on top of hundreds of private self-insured employers who've done this type of thing, suggest that it's not just a crazy idea anymore. Thank you. Uh, Andrea, yeah. question. Uh, yeah, Re-identify you. yourself, please. Yeah, Andrea Bayer, Mended Hearts. Um, my question is, short of, and this may sound um, kind of, it's not an antagonizing question, I promise. Short of a single-payer healthcare system, which we all can disagree or agree on, what is going to be the sustainable solution to make sure that patients, regardless of their income, are receiving a quality health care? Um, I can tell you through our organization we see patients who have the money to pay these high premium deductible or high premium costs for their health care are getting way better care than people who are stuck in the Medicare system or the Medicaid system where their, their choices aren't being made by their doctor, they're being made by their insurance company. So short of one system, what are we gonna be able to do to be able to assure that how much you're paying for your health care doesn't really regulate what your health care is providing you? Does that make sense? Grant, is there, is there, in fact, from your standpoint, a relationship between how you pay and the quality that you receive? Well, uh, yeah, I was going to say I'm probably the only one dumb enough to, to raise his hand, right? <laughs> Sorry. I mean, you're asking the kind of the universal question of all questions, you know, how do I get good medical care? But one of the things that that has been tried is something called clinical pathways. And it started in oncology and it's gone into other areas as well. And the, the idea is let's snip off 
the low end stuff that doesn't work. It's inexpensive, but it doesn't work. And the very high end stuff that costs a lot of money and it's just not worth it. And try to, to follow a standard cookbook kind of a pathway in oncology. And that generally was fairly well received. It hasn't quite grown as much as I imagined it would, but in places it's been working, it's been working reasonably well. So there are those kind of pathways. And one of the things that I had in my prearranged notes, which I haven't pulled out yet, <laughs> was something similar to that, that once you get put into that bucket of catastrophically ill, and I don't care if it's muscular dystrophy or it's MS or whether it's cancer, it doesn't matter, that there becomes kind of a standard playbook that you follow. And these clinical pathways are kind of the forerunner for that. I also think that once you get put into that bucket, and whether that's by your total spending or whether that's by your severity of illness, that you then get into a capitated out-of-pocket obligation as well. I can see there being a needs analysis and what you pay in your premium, but once you become sick, to continue to have you pay more because you can is kind of punishing you for being sick because you can. And if we could kind of get away from that and put people into these standard buckets, some like clinical pathways, but across a lot of areas, and that pathway would not only be clinical care, but financial obligation, that might be the beginning to kind of get everybody under one corral. Just a thought. So I'd love to hear anybody else. Good yeah. tool. For, thank you. Of it. And, and building on that, so you've got the clinical pathways. Now you've got to get the economic incentives to actually follow those clinical pathways. So, you know, a long time ago, I helped design uh, the DRG system, which essentially put all the hospital services into one bucket. And now we're doing bundles, we're doing managed care, we're doing a whole series of things. So what we're doing is taking these clinical pathways and giving some provider the incentive to do the thing that's probably as clinically appropriate as we can. So the more that we put things together and give people financial incentives to do the right thing, I think that that's the direction that I keep moving in. So thank you. There really is a, a chain there of reasoning in, in answer to Andrea's question, although it's a system-wide one, which is collect data, build the evidence, gain a knowledge base, translate it into clinical practice guidelines, which can often be transformed into pathways which are more specific. And then you got the pathway, but you have to make sure the incentive's in place to actually use them. So there is kind of a chain of stuff that actually starts with real data and not just opinion. So point well taken. Question back here on the aisle, name and affiliation. And we'll, yeah, go ahead. Hi, John, John Beckner with the National Community Pharmacists Association. Uh, historically, one of the biggest barriers to access has been a fairly cumbersome prior authorization system. Is there anything currently being done to address that, make it better, make it more efficient? Sure, I, I mean, I, there are efforts to um, be able to do electronic prior auth. I mean, I, I don't wanna say it's widespread, but I know within certain plans, PBMs and others, uh, especially with the growth of um, EHRs and other technology, that um, that there is the ability to do some electronic prior authorization. It's, it's not everywhere, and it also depends on the level of complexity um, of the therapeutic area. It depends on the level of, of system that uh, a provider might have to be able to pro provide that real-time clinical information so that a plan could do essentially um, uh, prior auth at the at the point of prescribing, um, so I, I'd say it's it's happening, but I think there's still more that needs to be done there. Good. I think Thank it's you. A, an effect of, of fee for service medicine, and that the more you do, the more you get paid, and so that's why you need the prior authorization. You change the financial incentives, and you can you know essentially I would say do away with prior authorization, but you can reduce the the prevalence of prior authorization if the incentives are different. I, that's well, a great point. Yeah, but, but most physicians don't make money prescribing drugs outside of Part B. So I, I actually think I want to agree with Matt. The, the electronic, met, and so, you know, this multi-stakeholder group in the room needs to get behind the fact that the investment we've made in EMRs have been woefully underutilized to take care of patients, right? right? They have been uh, done a great job to take care of people who are trying to maximize their billing and efficiencies. So imagine not only a prior auth that may tell you that you're doing something that you shouldn't be doing. Imagine your EMR telling you, sir, a pharmacist, that a patient's A1C remains high despite the use of multiple generic medicines, and the only alternative is a branded drug that I have to have a prior auth to. Imagine that EMR removing that prior auth when the, when the drug is clinically indicated, 
Right, so the, the EMR is really key, and there's some really advanced folks around the country, Scott Weingarten at Cedar sinai among others, who have really started to think about using the EMR to provide the efficient. So we are on the verge of being able to do that in a practical, practical basis. Back corner, yes. Oh, hi. Hey, Jagba. Go ahead. Hi, Jagba Doshi from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I wanted to make a broader comment, but uh, since that comment came up, I have another question first before I make a broader comment. And so okay. the question is to Matt. Uh, to the extent uh, uh, if we are streamlining prior authorizations that Mark, as you were pointing with the EMRs and everything else, um, here's a slight twist to the value-based insurance design idea where we kind of design either clinically nuanced value-based uh, 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 formularies, or what Jerry was mentioning earlier, that you know, do I trust my plan to decide what's best for me, or do I trust my doctor to decide what's best for me? And my point is that once a patient qualifies through a prior art, so the physician has filled out a form and has demonstrated a clinical need for the patient that this drug is needed, at that point in time, why couldn't we waive co-payments or lower co-payments for, uh, for those patients? Is because the, then it makes Jerry happy, it makes Mark happy, and most importantly, it makes the patients happy. We want to make all of them no, happy. Th Mark? This, this is uh, reward the good soldier. So again, you all see that VBI, just Google VBID. The first thing you'll see <laughs> is that this is not just a brilliant academician from the uni great University of Pennsylvania. There are organizations, some in the room might want to speak up, that have their own benefit design say that if you fail a, a low value therapy and the evidence says that this, what one time was a high cost, low value therapy, but because the low cost therapy doesn't work, it becomes a higher value therapy, it should be encouraged, not discouraged. Right, so, Mark, and my point is, uh, my question so is to Mark. AHIP supports it. No, that, so they why aren't it. we seeing more plans do that? Right now, for PCSK9 inhibitors, providers have to fill out five pages worth of forms. They have to fax in every medical record for these patients, jump through hoops. I've heard Steve Nissen talk about employing a full-time cardiologist just to uh, you know, process the prior authorization form. So once that's taken care of, why can't we have that FH patient access the drug for a low-cost share or, mm. or no-cost share Matt. for that matter? It, I mean, it, it is, it's, I don't want to say it's ubiquitous, but it's happening, and we're moving in that direction, and perhaps the systems that, you know, you're working with or the plans perhaps in, uh, in your backyard have not gotten that far, but it's, it's happening. I, again, I think all of us want to see more progress faster so that we can move towards these value-based benefit designs, but it, it's the, the, both the systems build by making sure that you have the records and the infrastructure um, again, I, not to make excuses, it just ta it's taking longer, I think, than all of us would, would like to see it. Good thing. Uh, before you go on, uh, Grant, on this point. Yeah, I've got a comment for, for the general um, audience as well, is, you know, medicine is not linear. Your diseases don't always follow a straight line. So there is a value in having prior authorization because the disease state may go into remission, it may accelerate, it may go sideways, all those kind of things may happen. And if you don't have a touch point every so often, it doesn't have to be you know, 15 pages of paperwork, but if you don't have that built-in touch point for a number of diseases, you lose the opportunity to maybe change therapy, delay therapy, even increase therapy. So it's not always just about cost savings and managing money. Sometimes it's about managing patient outcome also. So it's, it's not all bad. Thanks, we, we call this dynamic benefit design. That 98% of Americans are in particularly for drugs, in a, in a set of tiers that are static. And the fact is that just about every chronic disease for which Dan and Amy deals with, these diseases change over time. I'd like to think that Grant was, that most of them get, actually get better. Most of them slowly progress. You need to add medicines in just about every one of the top 10 diseases that we're dealing with in the Medicare Advantage VBIT demo, which is why we want to see these dynamic cost-sharing things. We don't want everyone to get, you know, cefakilamol or cancer kill them all, first line, if there is a lower cost effective therapy to try first, such as the methotrexate exam. Thank you. Jalpe, are you ready to give up the microphone? You have it in two hands now, I see. I actually got digressed because of that comment, but I, I really oh. wanted to make an overarching comment, and I, I will just take two minutes. I'm sure it'll be brief. Very brief. Thank you. Um, and I think, uh, I think that uh, the main comment that I wanted to make was uh, just 
having sat through this all day and having been thinking about this for many, many years as part of my academic career, this particular issue, it's, it's extremely clear that at this point in time, we need every stakeholder in the system contributing to a solution. Uh, Mark very nicely said, you know, what matters to the patient is just not the drug price, but it's what their out-of-pocket price is. But we know what the out-of-pocket price the patients face. Uh, every stakeholder in the system has a role to play in it. That includes providers, it includes pharma, it includes health insurance companies, and it includes organizations like uh, PAN Foundation. Okay. And to hearing, uh, uh, you know, what Dan Klein had to say earlier about helping, you know, half a million Medicare beneficiaries over the last two years, the kind of data that we presented this morning in the Medicare population and the studies we have ongoing in our team. But my, and, and to the extent, I don't know if the congressman is still here, the question I really have is, why is it that we treat our older Americans so badly? Uh, thank you, Jalpa. Um, that you, do you want to take that as a rhetorical question, or do you have a hard answer to that? Um, I, I'm just going to just say that. I, I, my, my point here is, I think we all should contribute to this uh, solution because it's for our parents, it's for our grandparents, and in fact, it's for all of us because we're all coming down the pike. Thank you very much. You. Point well taken, nice, nicely stated. Any other question uh, from the floor? Any, any final, any, a, a bit of challenge? Yes, uh, on the aisle. And your name and affiliation, please. Yes, hi, Susan Thornton. I'm the CEO of the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation. So we're a small rare disease, and this has been a fabulous day. So thank you for holding it. But one thing I would say is that I always see missing the patient organizations, and everyone talks about patient-centric and the, the importance of the patients. I don't see any patient organization represented on this panel. And I know we're all in the room, and I think we need to be stakeholders at the table as well, because there's always somebody that falls out of the clinical pathways. There's always an exception. So how do we make room for that as well, so that these people don't fall through the cracks, because they fall through the cracks every day. And okay. we're here as professionals, to be able to help that and to bring those stories to the table so we can make sure that doesn't happen in the future. Okay, thank you. I don't think there was a question there, but uh, your point was a strong one, we appreciate it. We did have a bunch of patient representation earlier this morning. Can I, I ask a question back? If Grant, she's gonna ask us questions, I'm gonna ahead. ask you a Bring question. Bring that microphone back to the woman in the aisle, please. So if she's they gonna need it. So if they fall through the cracks, um, what's your ratio between the clinical cracks and the administrative financial cracks? Where do you see the biggest failing of those bodies? We don't know, I would ah. say, because in my world, in a small rare disease with 30,000 people diagnosed in the US and a small organization like mine with six people that cover the world, we don't have the capacity to be able to collect the data. So we work with PAN um, when, they have it, when they have a program open for our patients, which we don't and haven't for the last year. Uh, so I don't have the capacity, so we need help to figure out how to capture that data so we can better report on it. Yeah, so, okay. so Mark? My, my answer to that, so um, I support uh, engaged patients. I support accountable uh, consumers, whether you're a rare disease or a common disease. You all, so I view myself as a patient advocate, you have to fight against skin in the game when skin in the game is determined as making you pay more for everything. Right? Agreed. So, you know, I, as, as the congressman walked back in, you know, I love the idea of an engaged, accountable consumer, but I do not want my patient who had a free mammogram or a free cervical cancer screen, as we have an obstetrician gynecologist here, to send me an email, thanks for this free screening, I have to take out a second mortgage on my home to get the recommended chemotherapy for my specific cancer, yeah. right? So skin in the game is a term in this town that started out 10 years ago with good intentions, but had, had been tied by some scrupulous consultants to high deductibles for everything. And that's yeah. where I believe the cracks are. And they're only gonna get worse unless, unless we fight to close them in a nuanced way. Yeah, no, okay. and we're tr we will try to help however we possibly can in addition to doing what we do every day to try to direct people to the right. Thank you. Was there a last question from the floor? Front row, name again, Mary. Hey there, uh, Mary Richards. Um, this is really interesting, and I, I think the skin in the game thing get, gets to the, all of the organizations that I work with. 
patients are increasingly financial stakeholders in their own health care. So when you visualize the conversation, I think that, that we idealize between a patient and the doctor to have a conversation around the right treatment at the right time. But we also need to sort of, I, I picture 50 people in suits behind each one of those human beings because you also want the right health insurance for the right conditions that you're facing. And you also need the right outcomes data. And I don't know that those two human beings in that moment have that kind of access to information. We're trying to figure out the right way of being financial stakeholders who then also influence the institutions that we're paying money to that are rewarded by trying to give us the care that we need, whether it's a PBM or a drug company or a biologic company or an allied health professional. So my question, I think, to the panel is, as we all are financial stakeholders in healthcare at this point, each one of us, mm -hmm. how is it that there is an appropriate engagement to connect the right, I, I think, data in general with the folks who can best use it? So I think that the electronic health records conversation is an important one here, but is there a way to empower patients um, as well as their providers and everyone in the system to have the right information about each other at the right time. Okay, so suited. what else can we do to put the, pa the information at ready access to the patient when she or he needs it at a level uh, where uh, it is fully comprehensible and actionable? Any, I, we talked about the EHR just a bit. Jerry got an answer to that one. doctor or whomever doesn't always find it useful, the information we're providing, and mostly because they don't necessarily have the right financial incentives to get the right information. So again, coming from me, my perspective, which is from an economics perspective, I want to make sure that the provider has the right incentives to, to pay attention to the information that he or she is going to get about the patient, and the patient has the right incentives as well. And I think then the data will flow from that. We have lots of data. Most of the time, the data that we have, we don't use because it's not all that valuable to the person making the decision. Got to be the right data. So, Thank you. So Briefly. Uh, Upton Sinclair said it's difficult to get a man to understand something if his salary depends on him not understanding it. So you and the other patient advocates in the room, fee for service must go. More is better, must go. There is more than enough money in the system. Transportation doesn't argue that, defense, education. We just have to change the conversation from how much we spend to how well we spend. And the more the how well is to, to uh, set on patient-centered outcomes, the better everyone is. The clinicians will make as much money, the, the health plans and the health sciences companies will make the same money, but we'll finally, for the first time, set our metric to health as opposed to other things which has been lost in this conversation. Thank you very much. Oh, so here, here's what we're gonna do now. We've got a closing question. We didn't plan this. Uh, so Dan Klein is holding his next uh, governing board meeting, and one of the breakouts during that very nice day on a Sunday uh, is a strategic planning meeting. And you've been called in as an outside expert to provide your one kernel of golden advice to the strategic planning effort of the PAN Foundation to their governing board. And you have attended this meeting and you said or heard something that they need to make sure they incorporate into their strategic plan for, let's say, the next five to 10 years. And you only have a sentence to say it. So Jerry Anderson is gonna set the great example of how to provide a golden kernel of advice in one sense to the governing board's strategic planning group. And that advice is what, Jerry? So are you gonna focus on a lot of small dollar items or are you gonna focus on a few very expensive items. Ah, his advice is in the form of a question because as we know, those few items that are very expensive can really be awe-inspiringly and budget-breakingly expensive. Thank you, Jerry Anderson. And we've got uh, Jenny Bryant next with her kernel of advice, the strategic plan. Uh, uh, I think I, I would say that to the extent that, that patient assistance is really about us safety net, no safety net can survive if every uh, high cost patient falls into it. And I think that um, what's important to be thinking about strategically is how to make sure that especially as we look at the 
Medicare benefit that um, there's a lot of attention to uh, helping that move in a value-based direction so that patients who need the medicine uh, can afford it and that we don't allow plans to be assessing cost sharing which will force people into the safety net for medicines that they absolutely need to be on. So that's about specialty tier appeals and exceptions. Another great bit of advice. Thank you, Jenny Bryant. Matt? Uh, so I'd say make sure you're investing in the right data analytics to understand exactly what's happening to the patients that you're serving. Aha. Uh -huh. Got to get that feedback, too. Thank you, Matt. Mark? The more you support clinically nuanced payment and consumer incentives, the better you'll be able to function as a true safety net organization. There you go. Thank you, Mark. And Grant? Um, I'm going to say always listen to the wisdom of patients and patient organizations. They bring a lot of insight that we might otherwise miss. Thank you very much, Grant. Dan, can you live with this advice? I, appreci I appreciate all of the advice. And um, we um, have these conversations with our board members like Grant you know, regularly. So uh, we do take uh, a lot of the um, advice we get and we uh, either use it to uh, improve our program or we try to use it to advocate for uh, a uh, stronger safety net. Um, I will say that, you know, there's uh, um, an important distinction to make um, between all of us being financial stakeholders in our care, which I don't think there's a big argument about. I think uh, back in the day of the RAND study, that skin in the game was uh, five or 10 or $15 as opposed to what it is uh, today. Um, and so there was a different meaning when uh, the idea was uh, developed. What PAN's concerned about is not financial stakeholders, that patients are financial stakeholders. We're concerned about patients becoming financial casualties. And you know that's really the, uh, the issue for PAN. And um, we uh, are able to do a lot, but we're not going to be able to keep up with the uh, need. So we do need to find you know, other strategies. Good, thank you. Uh, in a minute, Amy Niles is going to come up to, uh, for a few closing remarks. But before she does, uh, this panel has been extraordinarily, but not surprisingly, full of candor. Um, and they have faced up to the toughest issues, answered some very difficult questions, and all in a constructive way, which flowed into the best strategic planning advice you're going to get for free in a long time from the top people. So Jerry Anderson, Jenny Bryant, Matt Isles, Mark Fendrick, Dan Klein, Grant Laws, thank you very, very much. It was great input. Thank you very much. Thanks.